and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com. Also post links at cursewildertoday.com and pieville.net. Today we're going to do a portion of Chapter 18 of 200 Years Together. Chapter 18 is called In the 20s. This will be recording number 27. Let's get to it. It's not going to be too long today. It's going to be a little short. Probably we'll break chapter 18 in about three parts. Do about 10, 12 pages today. Chapter 18 in the 1920s. 200 years together. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the story of Russia and Jews and their interactions. Chapter 18 in the 1920s. The 20s in the Soviet Union was an epic with a unique atmosphere a grand social experiment which intoxicated world liberal opinion for decades. And in some places, this intoxication still persists. Again, he's writing this in the 1990s. However, almost no one remains of those who drank deeply of its poisonous spirit. The uniqueness of that spirit was manifested in the ferocity of class antagonism, in the promise of a never-before-seen new society, in the novelty of new forms of human relationships, in the breakdown of the nation's economy, daily life, and family structure. The social and demographic changes were, in fact, colossal. The, quote, great exodus of the Jewish population to the capitals from the hinterlands, or the former Pale of Settlement, that is, capitals are St. Petersburg and Moscow, the great exodus of the Jewish population to the capital, so they're flocking to the capital now that their people have taken power, began for many reasons during the first years of communist power. Some Jewish writers are categorical in their description. Quote, Thousands of Jews left their settlements in a handful of southern towns for Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev to find, quote, real life, unquote. Beginning in 1917, quote, Jews flooded into Leningrad and Moscow. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, quote, hundreds of thousands of Jews moved to Moscow, Leningrad, and other major centers. Quote, in 1920, 28,000 Jews lived in Moscow. By 1923, about 86,000. So the population tripled in, in the five years after the revolution. According to 1926 USSR census, 131,000, and in 1933, 226,500, so a quarter of a million within 15 years of 1917, from a mere 20 plus thousand in 19, almost 10 times from 1920 to 1933 in Moscow. Quote, Moscow became fashionable, they used to say half seriously in Odessa. Lurie Larin, hyphenated, a fanatical and zealous Bolshevik leader during the war communism, quote unquote, writes that in the first years, not less than a million Jews left their settlements. In 1923, about half of Ukraine's Jews lived in large cities, pouring as well into parts of Russia formerly off limits to Jews, so called, quote, prohibited provinces, unquote, from Ukraine and Belarusia into Transcaucasia and Central Asia. The magnitude of this flow was half a million, and four-fifths of them settled in the RSFSR. One in five of the Jewish migrants went to Moscow. Mr. Or M. Agurski considers Larin's numbers to be substantially undercounted and points out that this demographic change affected interest important to the Russian population. During, quote, war communism, unquote, with its ban on private trade, and limitations on craftsmen and on those of certain, quote, social origins, like bourgeoisie or whatever, there arose a new social category, the, quote, deprived, unquote, deprived of civil rights. Quote, many Jews were deprived of civil rights and numbered among the, quote, deprived. Still, quote, the migration of the Jewish population from Belarusia into the interior of the USSR, mainly to Moscow and Leningrad, did not slow. The new arrivals joined relatives or co-ethnics who offered communal support. We're at the bottom of page 552. According to the 1926 USSR census, 2,211,000, or 83% of the Jewish population, lived in cities and towns. 
467,000 lived in rural districts. Another 300,000 did not identify themselves as Jews, and th these were practically all city dwellers. About five out of six Jews in the USSR were urban dwellers, constituting up to 23% and 40% of the urban population in Ukraine and Belarusia, respectively. Most striking in the provincial capitals and major cities was the flow of Jews into the apparatus of the Soviet government. Or Jean Nikidza in 1927 at the 15th Communist Party Congress reported on the, quote, national makeup of our party, the, the nations. By his stats, Jews constituted 11.8% of the Soviet government of Moscow, 22.6% in Ukraine, thir including 33% 30.3% in Kharkov, the capital, 30.6% in Belarusia, 38.3% in Minsk. If true, then the percentage of Jews in urban areas about equaled that of Jews in the government. Solomon Schwartz, using data from the work of Lev Singer, maintained that the percentage of Jews in the Soviet government was about the same as their percentage of the urban population, and it was significantly lower in the Bolshevik party itself. Using Orjanikidze's data, Jews at 1.82% of the population by 1926 were represented in the apparatus, capital A, at about 6.5 times their proportion in the larger population. It is easy to underestimate the impact of the sudden freedoms from pre-revolutionary limits on civil rights. Quote, earlier, Power was not accessible to Jews at all, and now they had more access to power than anyone else, according to I. Beekerman, direct quote. This sudden change provoked a varied reaction in all strata of society. S. Schwartz writes, quote, From the mid-twenties there arose a new wave of anti-Semitism, unquote, which was, quote, not related to the old anti-Semitism, nor a legacy of the past. Quote, it is an extreme exaggeration to explain it as originating with backwards workers from rural areas as anti-Semitism was generally not a fact of life in the Russian countryside. No, quote, it was a much more dangerous phenomenon. It arose in the middle strata of urban society and reached the highest levels of the working class, which before the revolution had remained practically untouched by the phenomenon. Quote, it reached students and members of the Communist Party and the Komsomol, and even earlier, local government in smaller provincial towns where, quote, an aggressive and active anti-Semitism took hold. The Jewish Encyclopedia writes that from the beginning of the 20th century, quote, though official Soviet propaganda writes that anti-Semitism in the latter part of the 20s was a, quote, legacy of the past, quote, from the Jew Encyclopedia, the facts show that it arose mainly as the result of colliding social forces in large cities. It was fanned by the widely held opinion that power in the country had been seized by Jews who formed the nucleus of the Bolsheviks. Beekerman wrote with evident concern in 1923 that, quote, the Jew is in all corners and on all levels of power. The Russian sees him as a ruler of Moscow, at the head of the capital on Neva, and at the head of the Red Army, a perfected death machine. He sees that St. Vladimir Prospect has been renamed Nakimson Prospect. The Russian sees the Jew as a judge and hangman. He sees the Jews at every turn, not only among the communists, but among people like himself, everywhere doing the bidding of Soviet power. Not surprising, the Russian, comparing past with the present, is confirmed in his idea that power is Jewish power, that it exists for Jews and does the bidding of Jews. Rational response to reality. RRR. No less visible than Jewish participation in government was the suddenly created new order in culture and education. So we move on to 554. The new social inequality was not so much along the lines of nationality as it was a matter of town versus country. The Russian reader needs no explanation of the advantages bestowed by Soviet power from the 20s to the 80s on capital cities when compared to the rest of the country. One of the main advantages was the level of education and range of opportunities for higher learning. Those established during the early years of Soviet power in capital cities assured for their children and grandchildren future decades of advantages vis-a-vis -vis those in the country, 
the enhanced opportunities in post-secondary education and graduate education and increased access to the educated elite. Meanwhile, from 1918, the ethnic Russian intelligentsia was being pushed to the margins. In the 20s, students already enrolled in institutions of higher learning were expelled based on social origins policy. Children of the nobility, the clergy, government, bureaucrats, military officers, merchants, and even children of petty shop owners, shopkeepers were expelled. So they're kicking out the native Russians who had any kind of a, you know, the right half of the bell curve background, bourgeois or whatever, above average. Applicants from these classes and children of the intelligentsia were denied entry to institutions of higher learning in the years that followed. As a, quote, nationality repressed by the Tsar's regime, unquote, Jews did not receive this treatment, so Jews had legal privilege after the Soviet Revolution. They were considered victims, repressed, so now they get special access to higher education. Despite, quote, bourgeois, bourgeois origin, again, remember, Communism is a Jewish racial attack on non-Jews, particularly whites, but it uses the disguise of being a class struggle. So here you see the reality, though. So in the papers, they denounce the bourgeois and speak for the workers, but the workers don't like Jews, and Jewish bourgeois are privileged, whereas white bourgeois are discriminated against. Despite, quote, bourgeois origin, unquote, the Jewish youth was freely accepted in institutions of higher learning. Jews were forgiven for not being proletarian. So don't pay attention to what they say, pay attention to what they do. So the, they talk about class struggle. The reality is it's a racial struggle, and they're putting their people ahead of ours. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, quote, with the absence of limitations based on nationality for entry to institutions of higher learning, Jews came to make up 15.4% of all university students in the USSR, almost twice their proportion of the urban population at large. Further, Jews, quote, owing to a high level of motivation, unquote, quickly bypassed the unprepared, quote, proletarian factory workers who had been pushed forward in the education system and proceeded unhindered into graduate school. In the 20s and 30s, for a long time after, Jews were a disproportionately large part of the intelligentsia. According to G. Aronson, wide access to higher and specialized education led to the formation of cadres of doctors, teachers, and particularly engineers and technical workers among Jews, which naturally led to the university faculty post in the expanding system of higher education and in the widely proliferating research institutions. So they're starting to dominate the professions and shut out, of course, as they always do, anyone who doesn't think the way they do. In the beginning of the 1920s, the post of the, quote, state chair of science was occupied not by a scientist, but by a Bolshevik official, Mandel Stamm hyphen Lyadov, or Lyadov, L-Y-A-D-O-V, Mandelstam Lyadov. Even sharper changes gripped the economic life of the country. Bukharin publicly announced at a Communist Party conference in 1927 that, quote, during war communism, we purged the Russian petty and middle bourgeoisie along with leading capitalists, unquote. When the economy was later opened up to free trade, that would be the new economic policy, quote, petty and middle Jewish bourgeoisie took the place of the Russian bourgeoisie. And roughly the same happened with our Russian intelligentsia, which bucked and sabotaged our efforts. Its place has been taken in some areas by the Jewish intelligentsia. So they're swapping, they're in the process of what I like to call swapping the goy head for the Jewish head. They're swapping the white head for the Jew head. They're putting their head on top of our nations and preventing us from organizing is a way of preventing us from getting back our natural head. If someone like me was running things, and I do as much as anyone represent the natural head of the white race, if I were running something, whites would not be discriminated against, obviously. Or if people who were loyal to their own kind were running things, they wouldn't act the way Jews do, because they're only loyal to Jews, while pretending to be loyal to different other nations. But all they care about is what is good for Jews. Now, again, the communist propaganda is 
that it's all about class. Really what I'm saying here is if, if this sucker, Solzhenitsyn, would look at it from the racial point of view and look at it from the true Jewish point of view rather than simply treating them as individuals and, and trying to make excuses for them, if he looked at it racially, he'd have a much better picture of what's going on. It's the exact same irritation we feel when we're reading E. Michael Jones writing from the Catholic point of view as the Solzhenitsyn writing from the Orthodox point of view. They are ideologically unwilling even to consider looking at Jews as something other than individuals who need to be converted to Christianity, right, at worst. Moreover, Jewish bourgeoisie and intelligentsia are concentrated in our central regions and cities where they moved in from western provinces and southern towns. So we have this communist revolution, which is basically a Jewish revolution. After the revolution, again, always the context, always the nutshell. The Jews leave, and he's saying from the west and south, where they are, Pale of Settlement mainly was. They flock to the capital, and the bourgeois, the native of the native stock, is all kicked out and replaced by Jews. And Jews are the upper and lower tiers of the administration of this new communism and the Communist Party. And Jews are getting advantages in higher education, whereas the natives are kicked out and discriminated against, all while they're pitching this class warfare propaganda. But it has nothing to do with class. It has to do with race. Here, quote, even in the party ranks, one often encounters anti-Semitic tendencies. Comrades, we must wage a fierce battle against anti-Semitism. Bukharin described a situation that was obvious to all. Unlike Russian bourgeoisie, the Jewish bourgeoisie was not destroyed. How about that? And this is what you'll see whenever there's communist. We saw that uh, various times wherever there's communist revolution, they never attacked the Jewish rich, only the Goyish rich. Now, bourgeoisie is an interesting word. In French, it means basically like, I think business owners, or particularly manufacturing owners, that, that type of level, whereas in the Anglophone world, at least in like America, it just means sort of upper middle class, I think. So it's slightly lower, maybe in the U.S. In, the, in France, I believe I'm right about this. It would mean someone who is a little higher than upper class. They would be like not the highest rich, but they'd be seriously rich. I think I'm correct in that distinction, but it's possible I'm not. Anyway, unlike the Russian bourgeoisie, the Jewish bourgeoisie was not destroyed. The Jewish merchant, much less likely to be damned as a, quote, man of the past, unquote, found defenders. Relatives or sympathizers in the Soviet apparatus warned about pending arrests or seizures, and if he lost anything, it was just capital, not life. Cooperation was quasi-official through the Jewish commissariat at the Subnarkom. S-O-V-N-A-R-K-O-M. The Jews until now had been a, quote, a repressed people. So again, notice they use the same words over and over. These are categorical ways of dealing with the world. So Jews are defined as a repressed people. Reality doesn't matter. It's all about manipulation of categories. Jews are good, and uh, Jews are victims, and Russians, whites are evil. So... And that meant, since they were declared officially a repressed people, it's just like declaring them an affirmative action category in the United States today. Naturally, they needed help. Lerin explained the destruction of the Russian bourgeoisie, quote-unquote, as a, quote, correction of the injustice that existed under the czars before the revolution, unquote. And so you see, really, what you're seeing is that their communist anti-white revolution has spread worldwide, at least in the white world, where there was already development. When NEP, New Economic Policy, was crushed, the blow fell with less force against Jewish NEP men, owing to connections in Soviet ruling circles, says Solzhenitsyn. Bukharin had been speaking in answer to a remarkable speech by Professor v. Y.V. Klyuchnikov, Klyuchnikov, a publicist and a former cadet, translators note, cadet is a constitutional democrat, Bukharin spoke in answer to a speech by Professor Y.V. Klyuchnikov, former cadet, in December 1926. The professors, and again, this chapter is about the 20s, 
The professor spoke at a, quote, meeting on the Jewish question, unquote, at the Moscow Conservatory. Quote, we have isolated expressions of hooliganism. Its source is the hurt national feelings of Russians. The February Revolution established the equality of all citizens of Russia, including Jews. The October Revolution went further with the Russian nation proclaiming self-renunciation. A certain imbalance has developed with respect to the proportion of the Jewish population in the country as a whole and the positions they have temporarily occupied in the cities. We are in our own city, cities, and they arrive and squeeze us out. When Russians see Russian women, elders, and children freezing in the street 9 to 11 hours a day, getting soaked by the rain in their tents at the market, and when they see relatively warm, covered Jewish kiosks, with bread and sausage, they are not happy. These phenomena are catastrophic and must be considered. There is a terrible disproportion in the government structure, in daily life, and in other areas. We have a housing crisis in Moscow. Masses of people are crowding into areas not fit for habitation, and at the same time, people see others pouring in from other parts of the country, taking up housing. These arrivals are Jews. A national dissatisfaction is arising, and a defensiveness and a fear of other nationalities. We must not close our eyes to that. A Russian speaking to a Russian will say things that he will not say to a Jew. Many are saying that there are too many Jews in Moscow. This must be dealt with, but don't call it anti-Semitism. But Larin regarded Klyuchnikov's speech as a manifestation of anti-Semitism, saying, quote, this speech serves as an example of the good nature of Soviet power in its battle against anti-Semitism because Klyuchnikov, K-L-Y-U-T-C-H-N-I-K-O-V, was roundly criticized by speakers who followed at the same meeting, but no, quote, administrative measures, unquote, were taken against him. Here it is the frustration of the communist activist. Agursky writes, quote, one would expect repression to swiftly follow for such a speech in the 20s and 30s, but Klyuchnikov got off. Maybe he received secret support from some quarters. But why look for secret causes, says Solzhenitsyn? It would have been too much of a scandal to punish such a famous publicist who just returned from abroad and could have harmed a reverse migration that was so important for Soviet authorities, that is, Jews flocking back in from places like New York City to strengthen and serve the communist revolution that was a Jewish revolution that was called the Russian revolution. Translators note, reverse migration means return of people who emigrated from Russia during previous periods of revolutions and civil war. The 20s were spoken of as the, quote, conquest by the Jews of Russian capital cities and industrial centers where conditions were better. As well, there was a migration to the better areas within the cities. G. Fedotov describes Moscow at that time, quote, The revolution deformed its soul, turning it inside out, emptying out its mansions and filling them with a foreign and alien people. A Jewish joke from the era, quote, Even from Berdichev, and even the very old come to Moscow, they want to die in a Jewish city. In a private letter, V. I. Vernadsky, translators note, a prominent Russian polymath, that means he knows a lot of different things, he's an expert in many different areas, in 1927 writes, quote, Moscow is now like Berdichev. The power of Jewry is enormous, and anti-Semitism, including in communist circles, is growing unabated. So if it's not a Jewish revolution, as Solzhenitsyn tries to argue, well, they, they, all the Jews in town are magnetized by it and come flocking right toward it toward its power centers and its positions. Laren, quote, We do not hide figures that demonstrate growth of the Jewish population in urban centers, unquote. It is completely unavoidable and will continue into the future. He forecasted the migration from Ukraine and Belarus of an additional 600,000 Jews. Quote, We can't look upon this as something shameful that the party would silence. We must create a spirit in the working class so that anyone who gives a speech against the arrival of Jews in Moscow would be considered a counter-revolutionary. In other words, defame and isolate and stigmatize and all the things the left always does, anyone who speaks the truth. And for counter-revolutionaries, there is nine grams of lead. That much is clear. That means shot in the head. 
But what to do about anti-Semitic tendencies, quote, even in, our, quote, our party circles was a concern of the upper levels of the party. According to official data reported in Pravda in 1922, Jews made up 5.2% of the party. Emma Gursky, quote, but their actual influence was considerably more. In that same year, at the 11th Communist Party Congress, at the 11th Communist Party Congress, Jews made up 14.6% of the voting delegates, 18.3% of the non-voting delegates, and 26% of those elected at the Central Committee at the conference, elected to the Central Committee. Sometimes one accidentally comes upon such data. A taciturn memoirist from Moscow opens Pravda in July 1930 and notes, quote, The portrait of the 25-member Presidium of the Communist Party included 11 Russians, 8 Jews, 3 from the Caucasus, and 3 Latvians. In the large cities close to the area of the former Pale of Settlement, the following data. In the early 1920s, party organizations in Minsk, Gomel, and Vitebsk in 1922 were, respectively, 35.8%, 21.1%, and 16.6% Jewish. Laren notes, quote, Jewish revolutionaries play a bigger part than any others, any others, in revolutionary activity, unquote, thanks to their qualities. Jewish workers often find it easier to rise to positions of local leadership. In the same issue of Pravda, it is noted that Jews at 5.2% of the party were in the third place after Russians, 72%, and Ukrainians, 5.9%, followed by Latvians, 2.5%, and then Georgians, Tatars, Poles, and Belarusians. Jews have the highest rate of per capita party membership. 7.2% of Jews were in the party versus 3.8% for Great Russians. Move on to 557. Emma Gursky correctly notes that in absolute numbers, the majority of communists were, of course, Russians, but, quote, the unusual role of Jews in leadership was dawning on the Russians, unquote. It was just too obvious, says Solzhenitsyn. The unusual role of Jews in leadership. Quoting a Jew saying that. Almost everything, he's like McDonald, everything is him quoting Jews. L literally, like 75% of this book is him quoting Jews, saying whatever point he wants to make, proving it using Jew sources so they can't accuse him of being biased. For instance, Zinoviev, quote, gathered many Jews around himself in the Petersburg leadership. Argursky suggests this was what Laren was referring to in his discussion of the photograph of the Presidium of the Petrograd Soviet in 1918 in this book. By 1921, the preponderance of Jews in Petrograd Communist Party organization, quote, was apparently so odious that the Polop Bureau, reflecting on the lessons of Kronstadt and the anti-Semitic mood of Petrograd, decided to send several ethnic Russian communists to Petrograd, though entirely for publicity purposes, so they needed a goy front, a white face on their Jew brains and their Jew control, like they do in the West these days. So Uglanov, U-G-L-A-N-O-V, Uglanov took the place of Zoran Hornberg, Hamburg, as the head of Gubcom. Komarov replaced Triliser and Semyonov and went to the Cheka. But Zinoviev objected to the decision of the Politburo and fought the new group. As a result, Uglanov was recalled from Petrograd and, quote, a purely Russian opposition group formed spontaneously in the Petrograd organization, a group, quote, forced to counter the rest of the organization whose tone was set by Jews. But not only in Petrograd, at the 12th Communist Party Congress, 1923, three out of six Politburo members were Jewish. Three out of six. Three out of seven were Jews in the leadership of the count. Komsomol, and the Presidium of the All-Russian Conference in 1922. This was not tolerable to other leading communists, and, apparently, preparations were begun for an anti-Jewish revolt at the 13th Party Congress, May 1924. Quote, there is evidence that a group of members of CK was planning to drive leading Jews from the Politburo, replacing them with Nogin, Troyanovsky, and others, and that only the death of Nogin interrupted the plot. Unquote. His death, quote, literally on the eve of the Congress, 
unquote, resulted from an, quote, unsuccessful and unnecessary operation for a stomach ulcer by the same surgeon who dispatched Frunza, or F-R-U-N-Z-E, with an equally unneeded operation a year and a half later. I guess he's hinting that someone uh, was set up. I don't know if the same surgeon was a Jew or the party just had this guy taken out. The Cheka Extraordinary Commission in English, GPU, goes through various uh, name changes, of course, as we know, ending, culminating in KGB. The Cheka hyphen GPU had second place in terms of real power after the party. A researcher of archival material, whom we quoted in chapter 16, reports interesting statistics on the composition of the Cheka in 1920, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 27. He concludes that the proportion of national minorities in the apparatus gradually fell toward the middle, toward the mid 20s. Quote, in the OGPU as a whole, the proportion of personnel from a national minority fell to 30 to 35 percent and to 40 to 45 percent for those in leadership. In parentheses, these figures contrast with 50 percent and 70 percent, respectively, during the Red Terror. 70 percent of the leadership of the Cheka during the Red Terror was non-Russian. That doesn't mean it was all Jews. It means it was not Russian. It could be Latvians as well, or Poles, or any other non-Russian nation. However, quote, we observe a decline in the percentage of Latvians and an increase in the percentage of Jews. These are the terror police, the political police, the night, the night, the night killers. The 20s was a period of significant influx of Jewish cadres into the organs of the OGPU. The author explains this, quote, Jews strive to utilize capabilities not needed in the revolutionary, pre-revolutionary period. With the increasing professionalism and need for organization, Jews, better than others, were able to meet the needs of OGPU and the new conditions. For example, three of Dzerzhinsky's four assistants were Jews, Yagoda, Gia Goda, V.L. Gerson, G-E-R-S-O-N, and M.M. Lutsky. Three of Dzerzhinsky's four assistants. Sometimes it's claimed Dzerzhinsky was a Jew. I think he was a Polish, whether or not he was a Jew. D-Z-E-R-Z-H. Dzerzhinsky. It's hard to pronounce. Moving on to 558. In the 20s and 30s, the leading Czechists, Czechists circled over the land like birds of prey, flying quickly from cliff to cliff, from the top ranks of the Central Asian GPU, off to Belarusia, and from Western Siberia to the North Cauc Caucasus, from Kharkov to Orenburg, and from Oral to Vinitsa, there was a perpetual whirlwind of movement and change. And the lonely voices of those surviving witnesses could only speak much later, without precise reference to time, of the executioners whose names flashed by them. The personnel, the deeds, and the power of the Cheka were completely secret. For the 10th anniversary of the glorious Cheka, we read in a newspaper a formal order signed by the omnipresent Unschlicht from 1921, deputy head of the Cheka, from 1923, member of Revoen Soviet, from 1925, deputy Narcom of the Navy. In it, Yagoda was rewarded for Quote, particularly valuable service for sacrifice in the battle with counter-revolution, unquote. Also given awards were M. Trilliser, distinguished for his, quote, devotion to the revolution and untiring persecution of its enemies, unquote, as well as 32 Czechists who had not been before the public until then. Each of them, with a flick of a finger, could destroy any one of us, says Solzhenitsyn with an exclamation point. Among them were Jakov Agronov for the work on all important political trials, and in the future he will orchestrate the trials of Zinoviev, Kamenev, the, quote, industrial party trial, the sabotage trial, and others. Zinovi Katznelson, Matvey Berman, transferred from Central Asia to the Far East, and Lev Belsky, transferred from the Far East to Central Asia. There were several new names, Lev Zalin, Lev Meyer, Leonid Bull, dubbed, quote, Warden of Solovki, Simeon Gendin, Karl Pauker. Some were already known to only a few, 
But now that people would get to know them, in this Jubilee newspaper issue, we can find a large image of Slick Mezhinsky with his faithful deputy Yagoda and a photograph of Trelisser. Shortly afterward, another 20 Czechists were awarded with the Order of the Red Banner, and again we see a motley company of Russians, Latvians, and Jews, the latter in the same proportions, around one-third. Some of them were avoiding publicity. Simeon Schwartz was director of the Ukrainian Cheka, a colleague of his, Yevsey Shervint, directed the transport of prisoners and convoys throughout the USSR. Yevsey Shervint, DT, VINDT. Naturally, such Czechists as Grimmerl Heifetz, a spy from the end of the Civil War to the end of World War II, and Sergei Spielglass, a Czechist from 1917 who, through his work as a spy, rose to become the director of the Foreign Department of the NKVD and a two-time recipient of the honorary title of, quote, distinguished Czechist, worked out of the public eye. Careers of others, so there's a lot of backroom Jews whose names are not known to the public. All they know is that people come and people are seized in the night and never seen again. Careers of others like Albert Stroman Stroyev were less impressive. He, quote, conducted interrogations of scientists during the Academy trial in 1929 to 1931. David Asbel remembers the Nakhamkins, a family of Hasidic Jews from Gamal. Asbel himself was imprisoned because of snitching by the younger family member, Lev. Quote, the revolution threw the Nakhamkins on the, onto the crest of a wave. They thirsted for revenge on everyone, aristocrats, the wealthy, Russians. Few were left out. This was their path to self-realization. It was no accident that Fate led the offspring of this glorious clan to the Cheka, GPU, NKVD, and the prosecutor's office. To fulfill their plans, the Bolsheviks needed, quote, rabid people, and this is what they got with the Nak Hamkins, N-A-K-H-M-A-N-K-I-N, Hamkins with N-A-K on front, Nak Hamkins, rabid people working for the Cheka, killing Russians as Jews. One member of this family, Roginsky, achieved, quote, brilliant heights, unquote, as deputy prosecutor for U the USSR, quote, but during the Stalinist purges was imprisoned, as were many, and became a cheap stool pigeon. The others were not so well known. They changed their last name to one more familiar to Russian ear and occupied high places in the organs. Unschlicht did not change his name to one, quote, more familiar to the Russian ear. See, this Slavic brother became truly a, quote, father of Russians, unquote. A war plane built with the funds of farmer mutual aid societies, that is, on the last dabs of money extorted from peasants, was named after him. No doubt, farmers could not even pronounce his name and likely thought that this Pole was a Jew. Indeed, this reminds us that the Jewish issue does not explain the devastation of revolution, albeit it places a heavy hue on it. As it was also hued by many other unpronounceable names, from Polish Dzerzhinsky and Eisband to Latvian Vatsetis. And what if we looked into the Latvian issue? Apart from those soldiers who forced the dissolution of the Russian Constituent Assembly, and who later provided security for the Bolshevik leaders during the entire Civil War, we find many highly placed Latvian Bolsheviks. Latvian. Gekker, G-E-K-K-E-R, suppressed the upri uprising in Yaroslavl, Gubernia. Among others, there were Rudzutak, Ika, Eichmanns from Solovki, M. Karklin, A. Kaktin, R. Kisis, V. Knorin. A. Skundra, one of those who suppressed the Tambov uprising, Czechist Peter Latsis, and an, quote, honorary Czechist Lithuanian I. Usis. This thread can lead directly to 1991. Pugo. And what if we separate Ukrainians from Russians, as demanded by the Ukrainians these days? We will find dozens of them at the highest posts of Bolshevik hierarchy, from its conception to the very end. No, power was not Jewish power then. Political power was internationalist, and its ranks were to a the large extent Russian. 
but under its multi-hued internationalism, it united in an anti-Russian front against a Russian state and against Russian traditions. In view of the anti-Russian orientation of power and the multinational makeup of the executioners, why in Ukraine, Central Asia, and the Baltics did the people think it was Russians who had enslaved them? Because they were alien. A destroyer from one's own nation is much closer than a destroyer from an alien tribe, and while it is a mistake to attribute the ruin and destruction to nationalist chauvinism, at the same time in Russia in the 20s, the inevitable question hanged in the air that was posed many a year later by Leonid Shapiro. Why was it, quote, highly likely that anyone unfortunate to fall into the hands of the Cheka would go before a Jewish interrogator or be shot by a Jew? That's again a Jew saying that, and that quote I have seen used by other people. It's like, oh yeah, this is not a Jewish thing, but then even a Jew admits, well, if you got caught and interrogated and shot by the Cheka, you probably came in front of a Jew, first asked questions, and then shot bullets at you. Says the Jew Leonard Leonard Shapiro, with a C-H. Yet the majority of modern writers fail to even acknowledge these questions. Often Jewish authors thoughtlessly and meticulously comply and publish vast lists of Jewish leadership of the time. For example, see how proudly the article, quote, Jews in Kremlin, unquote, published in journal Aleph, Aleph, provides a list of the highest Soviet officials, Jews for 1925. It listed eight out of 12 directors of Gazbank. The same level of Jewish representation was found among top trade union leaders. And it comments, quote, We do not fear accusations, quite the opposite. It is active Jewish participation in governing the state that helps to understand why state affairs were better then than now when Jews at the top positions are as rare as hen's teeth. Unbelievably, says Solzhenitsyn, and that was written in 1989. Uh, it just shows their capacity to ignore all the murder of the goy, because what does that mean to a Jew? Nothing. It's their religious right. Regarding the army, one Israeli scholar painstakingly researched and proudly published a long list of Jewish commanders of the Red Army during and after the Civil War. Another Israeli researcher published statistics obtained from the 1926 census to the effect that while Jews made up 1.7% of the male population in the USSR, they comprised 2.1 of the combat officers, 4.4 of the command staff, and 10.3 of the political leadership, and 18.6% of military doctors. And what did the West see? If the government apparatus could operate in secret under the Communist Party, which maintained its conspiratorial secrecy even after coming to power, Diplomats were on view everywhere in the world. At the first diplomatic conferences with Soviets in Geneva and The Hague in 1922, Europe could not help but notice that Soviet delegations and their staff were mostly Jewish. Due to the injustice of history, a long and successful career of Boris Yefimovich Stern, Stern is now completely forgotten. He wasn't even mentioned in the great Soviet encyclopedia, the GSE, from 1971. Yet he was the second most important assistant to Chicharin during Genoa Conference and later at Hague Conference, and still later he led Soviet delegation during long-standing demilitarization negotiations. He was also a member of the Soviet delegation at the League of Nations. Stern was ambassador in Italy and Finland and conducted delicate negotiations with the Finns before the Soviet Finnish War. Finally, from 1946 to 1948, he was the head of the Soviet delegation at the UN, and he used to be a long-standing lecturer at the High Diplomatic School. At one point during anti-cosmopolitan purges, he was fired, but in 1953, he was restored at that position. An associate of, Lenin, of Chicharin, Leon Hikis, H-A-I-K-I-S, Leon Hikis, worked for many years in the Narcomat of the Foreign Affairs, the NKID, in 1937, he was sent to a warmer place as an ambassador to the embattled Republican government of Spain, where he directed the Republican side during the Civil War, but was arrested and removed. Fyodor Rothstein founded the Communist Party in Great Britain in 1920, 
and in that very year, he was a member of the Soviet delegation in negotiations with England, with an exclamation point. Two years later, he represented RSFSR at the Hague Conference. As Litmanov's right-hand man, he independently negotiated with ambassadors to Russia in important matters. Until 1930, he was in the presidium of NKID, and for 30 years before his death, a professor at the Moscow State University. And on the other side of the globe, in southern China, M. Grusenberg Borodin had served for five years when the December 1927 Canton Rebellion against the Kuomintang broke out. It is now recognized that the revolt was prepared by our vice consul, Abram Hassis, who, at the age of 33, was killed by Chinese soldiers. His vesti ran several articles with the obituaries and the photographs of, quote, comrades in arms, unquote, under Kuibyshev, comparing the fallen comrade with a highly distinguished communist like Furmanov and Frunza. On to 561. In 1922, Gorky told the academic Ipatiev that 98% of the Soviet trade mission in Berlin was Jewish, and this was probably not much of an exaggeration. A similar picture would be found in other Western capitals where the Soviets were ensconced. The work that was performed in early Soviet trade missions is colorfully described in a book by G.A. Solomon, the first Soviet trade representative in Tallinn, Estonia the first European capital to recognize the Bolsheviks. There are simply no words to describe the boundless theft by the early Bolsheviks in Russia, along with covert actions against the West, and the corruption of soul these activities brought to their effectors. Shortly after Gorky's conversation with Ipatiev, I-P-A-T-I-E-V, he was, quote, criticized in the Soviet press for an article where he reproached the Soviet government for its placement of so many Jews in positions of responsibility in government and in industry. He had nothing against Jews per se, but departing from views he expressed in 1918, he thought that Russians should be in charge. And Pravda's twin publication, Dar Amos, Pravda in Yiddish, objected strongly, D-A-R, new word, A-M-O-S, Pravda in Yiddish, Dar Amos, Pravda means ideological truth, remember. Objected strongly. Do they, i.e. Gorky and Shalom Ash, the interviewer, really want for Jews to refuse to serve in any government position? For them to get out of the way? That kind of decision could only be made by counter-revolutionaries or cowards. In Jews and the Kremlin, the author, using the 1925 annual report of NKID, introduces leading figures and positions in the central apparatus. Quote, in the publishing arm, there is not one non-Jew, unquote, not one, in the publishing, all Jews in the publishing. And further, with evident pride, the author, quote, examines the staff in the Soviet consulates around the world, finds there is not one country in the world where the Kremlin has not placed a trusted Jew, exactly like the U.S. State Department nowadays. If he was interested, the author of Aleph could find no small number of Jews in the Supreme Court of RSFSR of the 20s, in the Procurator's Office and RKI. Here we can find already familiar A. Goikbarg, who, after chairing the Lesser Sovnarkov, worked out the legal system for the NEP era, supervised development of civil code of RSFSR, and was the director of the Institute of Soviet Law. It is much harder to examine lower, provincial-level authorities, and not only because of their lower exposure to the press, but also due to their rapid fluidity and the frequent turnover of cadres from post to post, from region to region. This amazing early Soviet shuffling of personnel might have been caused either by an acute deficit of, uh, excuse me, acute deficit of reliable men, as in the Lenin's era, or by mistrust and the, quote, tearing, unquote, of a functionary from the developed connections in Stalin's times. Here are several such career trajectories. I think we'll stop after this part. Lev Meryasin was secretary of Gubkom of Orel Gubernia, later chair of Sovnarkaz of Tatar Republic, later head of a department of CK of Ukraine, 
later chair of board of directors of Gazbank of USSR, and later deputy Narcom of finances of USSR. It really reminds me of cross-training. These Jews get all these different positions. You'd think they'd have to have expertise in one or the other area, but they're going from agriculture to finance, banks to publishing, or they're, they're, or they're representing in the north, the south, the east, the west. They're going abroad in the consulate. They're t it's a Jew takeover of the government, is basically. I don't care what he says. That's what I conclude. Morris Belatsky was the head of Polito Dell of the 1st Cavalry Army, a very powerful position, participated in suppression of the Kronstadt uprising later in NKID, then later the first secretary of North Ossetian, Abkam, and even later was first secretary of CK of Kyrgyzstan. A versatile functionary, Grigory Kaminsky, was secretary of Gubkam of Tula Gubernia, later secretary of CK of Azerbaijan, later chair of Kolkhoz Center, and later Narcom of Healthcare Service. Abram Kamensky was Narcom of State Control Commission of Donetsk Krivoy, Rag Republic, later Deputy Narcom of Nationalities of RSFSR, later Secretary of Gubkom of Donetsk, later served in Narcomat of Agriculture, then Director of Industrial Academy, and still later he served in the Narcomat of Finances. I mean, that's almost literally what I just said. How do you go from agriculture to banking to finance to industry to various other things? There were many Jewish leaders of the Komsomol, K-O-M-S-O-M, -O -O well, ascendant career of Efim Setlin began with the post of the first chairman of the CK RKSM, fall of 1918. After the Civil War, he became secretary of CK and Moscow Committee of RKSM since 1922, a member of Executive Committee of KIM, the Young Communist International, in 1923-24, a spy in Germany. Later, he worked in Secretariat of Executive Committee of Communist International, still later in Editorial Office of Pravda, and even later he was head of Bukharin Secretariat, where this latter post eventually proved fatal for him. I mean, they get around. The career of Isaiah Kurgin, K-H-U-R-G-I-N, was truly amazing. In 1917, he was a member of Ukrainian Rada, or Parliament, served both in the Central and Lesser Chambers, and worked on the draft of legislation on Jewish autonomy in Ukraine. Since 1920, so in 1917, he's doing Jewish autonomy in, in the Ukrainian Congress. Then after 1920, we see him as a member of VKPB, in 1921, he was the Trade Commissioner of Ukraine and Poland. In 23, he represented German-American Transport Society in USA, serving as a de facto Soviet plenipotentiary. He founded and chaired Amtorg, American Trading Corporation. His future seemed incredibly bright, but alas, at the age of 38, he was drowned in the lake. What a life he had. Let's glance at the economy. Moses Rukimovich was deputy chair of Supreme Soviet of the National Economy. Ruvim Levin was member of the Presidium of Gosplan, the Ministry of Economic Planning of USSR and chair of Gosplan of RFSR, later deputy Nar of Narcom of Finances of USSR. Zachary Katzenlebenbaum was inventor of the governmental, quote, loan for industrialization, unquote, in 1927, and therefore of all subsequent loans. He also was one of the founders of Soviet Gazbank, G-O-S-B-A-N-K. Moses Frumkin was Deputy Narcom of Foreign Trade from 1922, but in fact he was in charge of the entire Narcomat. He and A.I. Weinstein were long-serving members of the panel of Narcomat of Finances of USSR. Vladimirov Scheinfinkel was Narcom of Provand of Ukraine, later Narcom of Agriculture of Ukraine, and even later, he served as Narcom of Finances of RSFSR and Deputy Narcom of Finances of USSR. Jesus. If you're building a mill, you are responsible for possible flood. A newspaper article by Z. Zangville describes celebratory jubilee meeting of the Gosbank Board of Directors in 1927, five years after the introduction of Chervonets, a former currency of the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, C-H-E-R-V-O-N-E-T-S, 
five years after the introduction of chervonets, and explains the importance of chervonets and displays a group photograph. The article lauds Scheinbaum, or Scheinman, the chairman of the board, and Katzenelenbaum, Katzenelenbaum, a member of the board. Scheinman's signature was reproduced on every Soviet chervonets, and he simultaneously held the post of Narcom of Domestic Commerce from 1924. And hold your breath, my reader. He didn't return from a foreign visit in 1929. He preferred to live in bloody capitalism. Speaking of mid-level Soviet institutions, the well-known economist and professor B.D. Brutskis asks, quote, Did not the revolution open up new opportunities for the Jewish population? Among these opportunities would be government service. Quote, More than anything, it is obvious the large numbers of Jews in government, particularly in higher posts, and, quote, most of the Jewish government employees come from the higher classes, not the Jewish masses. But upper-class Jews required to serve the Soviet government did not gain but lost in comparison with what they would have had in their own businesses or freely pursuing profession. As well, those who moved through the Soviet hierarchy had to display the utmost of tact to avoid arousing jealousy and dissatisfaction. A large number of Jewish public servants regardless of talent and qualities, would not lessen anti-Semitism, but would strengthen it among other workers and among the intelligentsia. Unquote. He maintained, quote, there are many Jewish public servants, particularly in the commissariats devoted to economic functions. Laren put it more simply, quote, the Jewish intelligentsia in large numbers served the victorious revolution readily, realizing, quote, access to previously denied government service. G. Pomerant, speaking 50 years later, justified this. Quote, History dragged Jews into the government apparatus. Unquote. Jews had nowhere else to go to besides government institutions, including the Cheka, as we commented earlier. You're forcing them to torture you. You're forcing them to loan money and interest. The Bolsheviks also, quote, had no other place to go. The Jewish Tribune from Paris explains, quote, there were so many Jews in various Soviet functions because of the need for literate, sober bureaucrats. However, one can read in Jewish World, a per Parisian publication, that, quote, there is no denying that a large percentage of Jewish youth from lower social elements, some completely hopeless failures, were drawn to Bolshevism by the sudden prospect of power. For others, it was the world proletarian revolution, and for still others, it was a mixture of adventurous idealism and practical utilitarianism, that is, careerism and loxism. Of course, not all were drawn to Bolshevism. There were a large number of peaceful Jews whom the revolution crushed. However, the life from the towns of the former Pale of Settlement was not visible to ordinary non-Jewish person. Instead, the average person saw, as described by M. Heifetz, quote, arrogant, self-confident and self-satisfied adult Jews at ease on red holidays and red weddings. Quote, we now sit where the czars and generals once sat, and they sit beneath us. So Jews themselves saw it as a Jewish takeover of Russia. They were not unwaveringly ideological Bolsheviks. The invitation to power was extended to, quote, millions of residents from rotting shtetls to pawnbrokers tavern owners, contrabandists, seltzer water salesmen, and those who sharpened their wills in the fight for survival and their minds in the evening studying of the Torah and the Talmud. So it's open to you. So it's, that's again, it's proven that it's a racial thing. They don't care what their background is or their class. They only care that they're Jews. The authorities invited them to Moscow, Petrograd, and Kiev to take them into their quick, nervous hands that which was falling from soft pampered hands of the hereditary intelligentsia, everything from finances of great power, nuclear physics, and the secret police. They couldn't resent, resist the temptation of Esau, the less so since, in addition to a bowl of pottage, they were offered the chance to build the promised land, that is, communism. There was, quote, a Jewish illusion that this was their country. Many Jews did not enter the whirlwind of revolution and didn't automatically join the Bolsheviks, 
but the general national inclination was one of sympathy for the Bolshevik cause and a feeling that life would now be incomparably better. The majority of Jews met the revolution not with fear, but with welcome arms. Direct quote. Footnote, there's millions of footnotes. In the early 20s, the Jews of Belarusia and Ukraine were a, quote, significant source of power for the significant source of support for the centralization of power in Moscow over and against the influence of regional power. Exactly like in the U.S., they want to get rid of state rights so that a small minority can rule out of the capital. And their word is law everywhere from Siberia uh, all the way to Poland. Evidence of Jewish attitudes showed the overwhelming majority considered Bolshevism to be a lesser evil and that if the Bolsheviks lost power, it would be worse for them. Quote, now a Jew can command an army. This is the last paragraph in this we're going to do today. These gifts alone were enough to bring Jewish support for the communists. The disorder of Bolshevism seemed like a brilliant victory for justice, and no one noticed the complete suppression of freedom. Large number of Jews who did not leave after the revolution failed to foresee the bloodthirstiness of the new government, though the persecution, even of socialists, was well underway. The Soviet government was just as was as unjust and cruel then as it was to be in 37 and in 1950, but in the 20s it did not raise alarm or resistance in the wider Jewish population, since its force was not aimed at Jewry. And they could give a damn if uh, it's not them being killed, and they're happy to kill you. And then there's a break, so that's where we'll leave it today on 564. I've been Alex Linder reading to you out of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, and we've been doing chapter 18 in the 20s. And I think we've been summing up by saying we see yet again the kind of the identity of Jews of Bolshevism. I would say it much more stronger than, than he would. Yeah, there's Latvians, there's Ukrainians, there's Poles, there's other non-Russian nationalities, but Russia has been taken over by Jews, and the native white head, the elite, the intelligentsia, has been driven out and replaced by Jews. That's a terrible thing, and it means Russia is going to suffer hugely, and that is exactly what happened. And so it is in America, where whatever native white head there used to be is now replaced entirely by Jews. And whites such as me or others who might form the natural head of the community are shoved to the margins, even while they're... Uh, abused at all turns uh, due to ideologic ideology. So this is why the Learning College exists. It's a reaction to this Jewish takeover and this Jewish head on the white body. So thanks for being with me today. And as always, go to VNN Forum audio section for the permanent archive. And I'll be back with you again real, real soon.